Good morning, good morning, everyone. Going to share my screen as I am preparing for our session today on codependency. Yes, 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 everyone. Come on and join. Today I want to talk about codependency. I've been talking about anger. Um, the last two sessions that I did, my goal is to my goal is to um to talk about anger and talk about codependency because listen. I can't talk about nothing that I ain't been delivered from, right? Can't. I can't tell y'all nothing that um, I read from a textbook. However, I can tell you that, but um, telling you stuff that I read from a textbook would, would, be, would be just that. But my goal is to demolish what God has delivered me from, right? And so in demolishing that, that means I got to tell my business. I got to tell my testimony, right? I got to give what God has delivered me from. Now, do I have my doctorate degree in counseling? Yes. Uh, do Am I certified as a coach? Yes. So yeah, there are some things that I do know. Am I in school to get my licensure as a, uh, a clinical psychologist, a clinical therapist? Yes. Um, so there are some some things. It's a little dark. Let me um close this here. So there are some things that because of education that I'm technically going to bring into our discussions. Uh, but primarily, a lot of my information is coming from what I've went through as an individual. Because I can't tell you how to get across the bridge if I ain't go across the bridge first. Come on, that that it it just is what it is. And so we're talking about codependency today. Um, and uh, believe it or not, um, the root of a lot of anger is codependency. The root of a lot of rejection comes from codependency. A lot of times we don't even realize that we are in codependent relationships or um, we we have a codependent behavior due to traumatic or the complex traumatic issues that has arised in our life. You know, so I really want to, I just want to get right into it. Um, my goal is to come on every other week, to be consistent in that, to come every other week um, to talk about um, things that I've been delivered from that can, that has helped me so that it can help you. So let's just dive right on into it. Um, thank you for all who have joined. I do appreciate you guys. Um, at the end of the broadcast, you know, I have a link um, in the description. I offer free consultations for coaching, for counseling, and for mentorship. You can click on the on the link um, in the description and sign up for your free 15 minute consultation. Because if you need help, I'm here to help you. If you need counseling, if you need coaching, I'm here to help you. So let's dive right on into it. And of course, if you want to be a blessing to the ministry, you can cash app us at ilovehealthyme.com. I mean, I love healthy me. That's also in the description. So codependency. So I titled today's um, headline description discussion, codependency, the robber of image is the ultimate enabler and the people pleaser. Um, I want to talk about um, my, my testimony quite briefly. Um, as you guys have seen, I put on uh, Facebook some, some time ago, the beginning of November, how I graduated from anger and codependency at a facility called Celebrate Recovery. If you guys have never heard of Celebrate Recovery, I encourage you to find a location in your area 
it truly blessed me. The church that my husband and I went to at the time, um, it was Victory in Norcross. Um, it's no longer there. I hate that they shut it down because it was such a help. Um, but there is um, a Celebrate Freedom at this church called New Covenant um, in McDonough that I, I went to last, last Tuesday. Very helpful. It's a little different from Celebrate Recovery, um, whereas at Celebrate Recovery, you kind of voice what you're going through and there's not a whole lot of hands-on, but it is very, 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 very helpful because um, it helped me. Um, but at Celebrate Freedom at New Covenant, they kind of, you know, you ask questions, they give advice, you know, they pray for you, stuff like that. So, um, so you know, I struggle with codependency um, at a very early, early age. And so I want to first cover four factors over a course of some time. Like I said, I want to I really want to talk about this like every other week. I want to go back and forth between codependency and anger because that was the root of a lot of issues that I struggled with in my life. That if it had not been for the Lord demolishing it, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I didn't go through all this education and all this pain and all this hurt to be a garbage can of knowledge and not help, uh, help other people. You know, so I want to start off by four factors um, until the Lord says differently of, you know, when I walked in codependency from the age of 11 to the age of 45. So codependency, I want to talk about what it is, why it exists. Listen, everything begins with a seed. Everything in life begins with a seed. Oftentimes it starts with abuse. It starts with neglect. It starts with rejection. I want to talk about what happens when you're in a relationship with codependency. And I can, like I said, I can only talk about my experience. I can't talk about nobody else's experience. And now, and, and what I do want to say is codependency is not in a square peg. It's not in a square box. Um, there are several bullet points, several items um, when it comes to identifying codependency. Um, but you don't have to be all 10 or all 20. You can have several of the, the bullet points in codependency because codependency is vast. It, I mean, it really is. It's huge. Um, but I come to help you identify well, what's going on in your life. You know, so what happens? What happened to me when I was in a relationship with codependency? It changed my identity. My, my addictive behavior became explosive. I was extremely emotional and emotionally abusive, huh? I was at both ends of the, of the spectrum. You know, I was emotional and then I beat you down emotionally. So I was like, don't do that to me. But then I did that to you. Um, I, I walked consistently, consistently in anxiety, which is fear. Anxiety is nothing but fear. That's all anxiety is. We we take medication. Me, medication. Now, when, when I was suffering with this, the psychologist, because I went to a therapist and a psychologist, right? The psychologist is the one who prescribes the medication. Um, the counselor could not, right? Um, so, but I got the therapy from the counselor and the psychologist, um, he wanted to prescribe me medication. Um, and I got super spiritual and I was like, no, I don't need any medication. However, I did the work. Uh, I've heard of situations where people do these medication and there's nothing wrong with that. If that's the bridge that's going to get you over to the other side, then you use what you need to get you over to the other side. There's nothing wrong with taking medication. Um, however, there is something wrong if you're going to take medication and I did work. I chose not to take the medication, but I chose to do the work. So, um, I walked in constant anxiety, which was fear. And the fear was due to the unknown. I had no control over the unknown. So because codependency's behavior causes you to have a strong spirit of control, when I didn't have uh, control over what I didn't know, oh my God, you talk about fear, you talk about anxiety. I couldn't handle that because I had to be in control, which in all actuality, I wasn't in control, right? So I walked in constant anxiety. This spirit, this behavior 
of codependency, it causes you to walk in constant anxiety, which is fear, due to the fear of unknown. You lack trust tremendously. Oh, you don't even trust God. I mean, trust is like out the window, out the door. Trust, I trusted nobody, couldn't trust nobody because I couldn't trust myself, which is which was a a a, a another bullet point on codependency. You can't be trusted because your emotions keep you unreliable. So you can't be trusted and then you can't trust yourself. I want to teach us also a remind a reminder of, because I got constantly have to remind myself. I have not gone on to glory, right? And so this is a new behavior that I had to adopt and adapt to so that I will no longer go back to. So want to send a reminder to those who may be walking in freedom and no longer codependent, but I also want to um, help those to be free of codependency. Okay, so what is codependency? My definition of codependency is based on my own experience. Now I'm gonna give you what the textbook says, right? Um, and I see four people on, who is joining? Where are you joining from? Let me let me go on my phone before I delve in. And listen, you guys have any questions? I'm here for it, okay? Um, let, let me hear you. Let me hear your questions. Let, 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 let's, let's go into this thing. Let, let, let's do this thing. Let's see. Hey, Crystal. Good morning. Hey, Sandy. Amen. All right. So I'm going to keep my phone up in, in the case that somebody has questions. Listen, I'm here for it. Um, God is not a God of wasted time and I'm not either. You know, so if you need help, I'm here for you. All right, so what is codependency? My definition, like I said, my definition of codependency is based on my own experience. It's an alter ego. It's to get accepted or approved. It's an area of pretense. And I use pretense for protection. It's, it's rejection of self to get people to like me. Um, is relationship addiction, y'all. Because I didn't want to be by myself. But it was it was such a, a, a oxymoron, though. It was, it was so deceptive because I didn't want to be by myself, but I also rejected myself. Codependency, codependency causes you to reject yourself because you don't feel that you're enough. So you please others as a filter. You subconsciously experience separation anxiety from yourself. You know deep down inside what you desire, but you struggle with self-image. You seek approval from others, relationships that involves enabling behavior. You're an enabler and you get involved with those who, ha who have enabling behaviors due to the struggle of not wanting to be alone. But you can't be nothing to anyone else unless you're valuable to yourself first. And that's what I had to learn. You have to be that first before you can be any value to anyone else. Listen, like I said, you don't have to be all of these that I described, but some of these. Now, I pulled this from a blog. This is what the textbook says. It says, codependency is a concept that refers to psychological, spiritual, or emotional reliance on another person in a way that is self-destructive or harmful and often includes enabling behavior. Codependent relationships are often out of balance. For real, for real. <laughs> and a codependent person may ignore their own needs in favor of their loved one's needs. Codependent people have trouble establishing healthy relationships and may end up in one-sided or even abusive relationships. Codependent relationships can be intimate relationships or they can occur between family members or even within caretaking relationships. 
A caregiver, for an example, may become unable to set boundaries with the loved one being cared for and begin to neglect their own well-being. See, you enable and then you become the enabler. So I want to give some traits based on what I have experienced in my own life when it comes to codependency. Low self-esteem, people pleasers, seeking validation and the need for validation from others, lack of boundaries, control, love relationship addiction, huge. When you're in love with the idea of being in love, but not really in love with the person because you don't like being alone, that's a love or relationship addiction. When you're just in love with the idea of being in a relationship, but not really loving the person or wanting the person in the relationship, you're just in love with, I, I got a man, I got a woman, I'm in a relationship because I can't be alone. I don't want to be alone. That's a love addiction. That's a relationship addiction. I remember in 2006, when I first got delivered from being alone, I'll never forget it because I hated being alone. And this, and I'm going to give my testimony in a few minutes. This came from, you know, my abuse as a child at age 11. I had to be with a man. I could not function if I didn't have a man. I never had a problem getting a man because of how, of my behavior. And I'll get into that a little later. But when God began to heal me on the inside, it took a minute, y'all, because I was in and out. I was in and out. I was first introduced to being healed at age 25, but I became whole at age 45. Because in my 20s, I was still a little immature. You know, I was learning the value of me. Um, God was introducing me to me. Um, and I had to get familiar with me. Because uh, I was not familiar with me. Because I had so many other individuals in me that I didn't know who the real me was. And so when 2006 came and I was free of not needing a man or wanting to have a man, oh, that was good for me. It was like an aha moment. I was like, for real, Wani? I was like, you good? I mean, I woke up a whole different person because I really didn't need a relationship to function. Oh, sorry, y'all. I, I didn't need a relationship to function. But from age 11, I thought I need a relationship to function in this world. Codependency. Mm-mm. Needing validation from others. I couldn't set boundaries. My esteem was so low. I was a people pleaser because I had to be in a relationship with a man. Oh, but when I woke up September 2006, my, 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 you talk about an aha moment. You talk about a revelation from God. You talk about a feel good moment. Yes, it felt real good to be by myself and be okay with being by myself. Now, I wasn't completely delivered. I thought I was. I was not completely delivered because I didn't join Celebrate Recovery until 2014. Um, I, codependency causes you to put everyone's needs above your needs. Um, codependency is also, um, you find it hard to leave an abusive relationship. And Jesus, that was me. Oh my God. My 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 husband, my first husband, when I got married at age 21, he beat me the day after we got married. And I found it hard to leave the next day. <laughs> That's a whole nother story, but I found it hard to leave an abusive relationship because of where my mindset was. I was depending on that relationship to survive instead of being okay with me. My self-esteem was so low, I, I couldn't think outside of the abuse. I had to stay within the, within the abuse because I viewed that as love because of what I went through at age 11. Codependency also causes you to be an enabler. 
Let me give you an example. Well, I'm gonna do this for them this time. I'm gonna buy this for them this time. And maybe when I do this, maybe, maybe they'll come around if I do this for them. Sounds familiar? We enable, we, we do things to receive. We do things to get attention. We do things to people please because it feels what we think is a void in us. And it essentially is a void because it's the void that God has to make us whole in. So we do things out of pretense. We we people please out of pretense because we're 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 so uh away from the image that God created us in. Listen. Some may say, well, ain't nothing wrong with being nice. Ain't nothing wrong with buying things for people. Ain't nothing wrong with doing things for, for people. I, I didn't say it was. What I said was, why we do it? What is your motive for doing what you do? When you're codependent, you don't do it out of the pureness of your heart. You do it for a reason. You do it to people, please. You, you do it to get attention. You, you, you do it to fill the void. Um, you do it because you don't have boundaries. Codependency is after one of the greatest things God has ever given us, his image. It's after your identity. It seeks to rob you of who you are on the basis of approval from someone else when you have already been approved by God. Yes, Lystra, we people please out of pleasure. Yes, that's it. That's Listen, that's my mentor in marriage, y'all. <laughs> that's Elder Lystra Jones, exactly. Um, but when the door of deception has been opened in your life due to codependency, I come today my reason is not just to give you my testimony. My reason is not just to showcase what codependency is, but my reason for getting on this live today and on December 19th and in two weeks after that and two weeks after that until God say shift and go to the next subject is to shut the door, to help you shut the door to codependency. Why? Because codependency is destructive, is pretensive, is not you, it's of the enemy. And it comes to change your behavior so you don't renew your mind to walk in the image of who God has created you to be. And the reason why I can help you is because my codependency, like I said, started at age 11 when I was molested by Mr. Raphael Jackson. Yes, that's his name. I believe he's deceased, but if he's not, that's who he is but delivered by Jesus at the age of 25 and became whole at the age of 45. That seed of abuse at age 11 attracted me to abusive men, period. Perversion begat perversion. I didn't know what a healthy relationship looked like because my first relation with a man, I was violated. So that was my standard. It was all that I saw, it was all that I knew. So subconsciously, I felt the only way to get a man was by my body. But my first initiation of sex, not the violation, but the first time, first time I initiated sex was the year later at age 12. And I kept on having sex consistently after that. It was even said when I gave my life to Christ, <laughs> well, if it meant that she can't have sex anymore, salvation won't last. Well, it will be 35 years next March 4th. And I am still in a relationship with Christ because that's the only relationship that will allow other relationships to be healthy, to be whole, and to be sustained. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. He ain't just my savior, but he is my Lord, meaning he is the decision maker over every decision that I make here in the land. And when I get it wrong, when I walk in error, he reminds me of truth so that I can get it right. Oh, I'm talking about the lover of my soul. His name is Jesus. Jesus the Christ, who is my Lord. Would you let him be your Lord today? I needed him. I may not have desired him at first, 
But when I became in relationship with him, he was all that I desired. And my heart of stone had to be turned into a heart of flesh. And I gave him permission to do that? Will you give him permission to not be codependent? Will you give him permission to walk away from the spirit of perverseness? Are we going deeper today? Back then, I sought the approval perversely. No different from the spirit of homosexuality. Oh, I'm coming down your lane. Oh, yes. I have spoken with many who struggle with their sexuality. I don't know, it's like I'm a magnet to those and I'm sure it's because of my own experience with the spirit of perversion at age 11. So it's like it's like I'm a magnet to those who, who, who struggle with perversion, who struggle with lesbianism, who struggle with homosexuality because I'm compassionate with that. So it's easy for me to compel, it's easy for me to draw them in, to minister to them because I know the hole that they are experiencing in their heart. I'm passionate about devouring that spirit. Codependency is a seeker of approval. My my little cousin, Brian, I love the ground that he walk on. He's gone on to be with the Lord. And a lot of my friends from back at home, a lot of my friends here know about Brian. He was my baby. Listen, he knew God. My aunt raised him in Christ as well as myself. When my aunt passed, she said, make sure you take care of my baby. I was in my 20s and I did all I could to keep my word to my aunt. Brian was my baby. He knew the Lord. Um, Before I moved to Georgia in 98, Brian stayed at my side. And I made sure that he knew who Christ was. I made sure wherever I went, he went. It was me and Alonzo, me, Alonzo, and Brian. So wherever we was, he knew how to pray because we prayed. We taught him how to pray. Uh, He he would see us praise and worship God. So he learned how to praise and worship God. Uh, He was even my armor bearer at one time. He loved the Lord, but he had an issue with approval. He had low self-image. When I left and moved to Georgia, we stayed in touch. However, he shared with me that he too was violated by someone. And he struggled with homosexuality as a result of that seed. After after a while, the struggle was no more. He walked completely in the lifestyle. However, he never stopped going to church. But then he started going to a church that approved the spirit of perversion because the pastors were lesbians. I asked him, I was like, Brian, why would you start going to that church and stop going to the other church that, you know, you, we talked about that you said you like? Why, why would you stop? He said, cousin, because they accepted me for who, for who I was. The other church I liked, but they didn't approve of me. Approval, acceptance. They looked at me funny because of the tattoos and the way I dressed, but the other church didn't. They approved me. So it's like he left his relationship completely with God because of the approval of the lifestyle that he had. He said, cousin, he's like, Wani, I know you love me, but you don't approve of my lifestyle either. And they do. That crushed me because I knew what he was experiencing because of what I have come out of. But I know he's with the Lord because He knows, he knew God and he gave his life to Christ. So I believe at the end of his life, he knew how to get it right. I need to turn my ringer off. No no different from my nephew, Justin, who also struggles with this. When he called me, when he decided to walk in this lifestyle, of course I cried because Justin, that's my boo-boo. That's my baby. But he also confessed the need of approval because of how he felt as a child. Oftentimes, when I speak to those in the LGBT community, they struggle with the spirit of perversion. It's because they were sexually abused as a child. They were left as a child, emotionally abused as a child. Or the acts may not have happened as a child, but it may have happened at some point in their life. No different from mine 
or anyone else. The seed of perversion that entered my life was from a man, the opposite sex, and it grew. Others experienced it from maybe the same sex or the opposite sex, and that seed grew. Bottom line, the seed was planted and codependency was the end result. Low self-esteem, no boundaries, approval seekers. And it's after the image, the image that God created you to be. It's after your identity. It causes you to become an approval seeker when you have already had your approval from God. It's the spirit of deception. Codependency makes you feel like a failure when you're trying to move in the right direction. It causes you to relapse because your patterns are normally that of sabotage. Complex trauma bridges to codependency. If you see somebody experiencing codependency, it's because of complex trauma in their life. It's trauma upon trauma, upon trauma, upon trauma, upon trauma. And they feel like there's no out. There's no way of escape except to be approved by others, except to uh, lack boundaries, to have no trust. Trauma will cause you to neglect your identity because of shame and embarrassment. That's the root or the filter. It's a personal fight within. It's damaging, it's debilitating, and it's a vicious cycle. Suicide stems from codependency. Ask me how I know. I tried that too. You just want to end the pain. You just want to end what you feel. You just want to end it. You, you know, it, 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 it's, the, uh, uh, it's the separation anxiety. Separation anxiety from yourself. But you think it's the separation anxiety from others. But it's really from yourself. It's the fight within. It causes you to draw conclusions about yourself based on someone else's behavior. That's what I did for years. I drew conclusions about myself based on somebody else confession over me, behavior towards me. I drew a conclusion about myself. Oh, I must not be pretty because he cheated on me. I must not be enough because they're not giving me the attention that they give others. Others. Trauma causes you to walk in shame and embarrassment, like I said. It causes you to neglect and forsake your identity. And so you live your life based on what somebody else said or did. You give legs to the words, your emotions. No, you give legs to their words in your emotions. That's real crazy. I was walking around like a lunatic. I didn't even give legs to my own words, but their words became my words. And I gave legs to somebody else's words about me. Give legs to your own words about yourself. I'm here to help you stop the loud noise in your mind that keeps telling you that you are not enough. You are enough. Psalms 139 and 14 says, I praise you, Lord, because I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Do you believe that? Or is that a lie to you? You have to confess that to yourself. You got to kill negative thoughts that you hear in your mind. If not, you will repeat the cycle. It will be over and over and over and over and over. And you will feel trapped inside your mind, trapped inside your emotions like you can't get out. And suicide will be your result. Codependency will be your result. That's not who God created you to be. I'm here to announce to you, you you are enough you got to believe that you got to do the work I would not be here if I didn't make the choice to do the work listen I have to put some practical steps because I'm a practical person that's what counselors are we're practical step by step by step by step and so I had to practically put things in place you couldn't just give me a scripture and say you gotta do that no how do I do that 
What does that look like? What should I do today? Different from yesterday. How should I act? What should I say? Practically, I needed to know what to do. It started at age 22. I had to see myself as God saw me. I made the decision after I put my ex-husband out at age 22. The one who beat me the day after we got married. We got married September the 6th and he beat me September the 7th. I held on to that Negro. If he was alive, I would have said something else. But I held on to that Negro after he whipped me for eight months. Straight. But I had no clue because I was seeing through filters. I was seeing through images that was not me. The image that God created me in, I couldn't see that because of the seed of abuse that was deposited in me at age 11. I began to pray every day for pretty days. No lie. Lord, make me pretty. Because I didn't see myself as pretty. Literally, I did not see myself as pretty. I had very low to no self-esteem. I would look in the mirror and see Rayfield, my abuser. I didn't see myself. And I had given myself to the Lord. My life to Christ at age 20. And here I am, 22 years old, now praying for the image of God to be revealed to me. So I had to renounce that image out of me so that I can see myself. At age 25, it took three whole years. When the image of God was revealed to me, my confidence grew. I literally prayed every day to see what God saw. I prayed for pretty days. That's all I knew how to pray back then. My confidence is so, it, my confidence is like now to infinity and, and Elder Lister will laugh. I got confidence. Ain't no low self-esteem in me anywhere. Listen, some may call it arrogance uh, because of their self-esteem. Some may even call it extra because where they see themselves as, which is ordinary. I don't see myself as ordinary. Uh, I'm, uh, people call me extra because maybe they don't see themselves as extra. But I got confidence in God now. When I was 350, I had confidence. You couldn't tell me anything. Now that I'm 248, you still can't tell me anything because I see the image of God. It's not arrogance. It's confidence in him. In Psalms 139 and 14, I am made in God. Wonderful are the works of the Lord. My soul is glad because of that. Listen, those who know my story knows that it's God. I, I, my, my, my girlfriend Sandra, her birthday and Cheryl's birthday, they're, all, they're, they're both in November. Cheryl's birthday is, four, is 10 days after mine and Sandra's birthday is, I think, 18 days after mine. You know, so we're born in the month of November. And um, and I had uh, sent Sandra a, a little like a um, short video. And she said, my extraordinary girlfriend, my extraordinary friend, my extravagant friend. And I knew what she meant because she knows my story. Like Elder Lister, they know my story. Pastor Cheryl, they know my story. So it's not arrogance, it's confidence in God. <laughs> ain't no low self-esteem anywhere in my body why because i'm whole i'm not just healed there's a difference from being healed and whole i'm whole like i'm not a piece of sweet potato pie which is healing i'm a whole sweet potato pie or i'll use what i like cheesecake i'm not a slice of cheesecake which is healing i'm a whole cheesecake i am whole in god so that's the first thing number one the practical process is where I started. This was just a start because like I said, the perversion started at age 11. I started the work at age 22. God healed me at age 25. That's where it started. I became whole at age 45. It took 20 years. It didn't have to take 20 years, but I was in and out. I was trying to get to be a whole trying to retain my healing, 
but not knowing what it totally looked at, looked like I had to walk that thing out. I'm here to tell you it ain't going to take you 20 years because there's somebody here that's going to identify issues in your life, situations in your life to tell you so that you know what to do, how to do, and when to do it so that you won't stay in codependency as long as I did. So number one, the key, here are the practical steps. Number one, see yourself as God see you. Number two, self-talk. Huge. Self-talk. You have to confess over yourself every day who you are in Christ, period. Literally kill the noise, kill the negative noise. No more noise you hear. The, the louder the noise you hear, the louder your confessions need to be. I am qualified and I'm free. I am more than enough. I love myself first. I am not defeated. I lack nothing. I'm more than a conqueror. I am worth it. I'm good looking, period. Kill the noise with your confession. Number three, more self-talk. Self-talk is huge, baby. And it ain't because you're crazy. It's because you got to kill the noise in your mind. Because the enemy, you have opened the door to the enemy speaking over your life so long, you got to now take control and talk to yourself. I had to tell myself, no. No. When the negative thoughts came, I had to tell myself, no. No, Wani, no. Nope, I'm not thinking like that. Nope, I'm not going to do that. Nope, this time, no, no, no. I will literally walk through my house. No, because the thoughts are real, y'all. Them thoughts are penetrating. Them thoughts are evident. Them thoughts are your reality. But you got to change your reality starting with no. Put yourself first. I'm thinking of me now. No is a sentence. Tell yourself no. Come on, say it with me. No. And if you want to add thank you to it, at the end, just say, no, oh, thank you. <laughs> Number four, forgive yourself. You need you. Period. You need you. Because your wholeness starts with you. can nobody else be whole for you but you? If you keep getting mad at yourself, you'll never come out of the emotional rut. If you keep self-inflicting, because listen, I was self-inflicted in a minute. Oh my God. Self-inflict was my middle name. You got to forgive yourself, baby, because you need you. And God needs you. Number five, get up and get out the house. You got to change your pattern. I'm going to say it again. You got to change your pattern. I started dating myself while I was married. Back then, to the abuser. Shoot, I sure did. I would take myself to the movies. I would take myself to, to, the, to, the, to the restaurants. Back then, I don't think they had... Uh, the pedicures thing, but I remember going to the pedicures and getting a manicure. <laughs> but you have to change your pattern. And if I didn't have the money, because back then he will always say, I don't want my wife to work. So I didn't work. That was because because he was codependent too. You know, so codependent begat codependent. You because when you're codependent, you will marry a codependent or marry an enabler of codependency, which enable enabling is part of codependency as well. And so when you have two codependents in an in an in a relationship, all you see is abuse, right? And so um he he didn't want me to work, and I thought that was just something else. Oh, he don't want me to work, he must love me. Lies that was a form of control. You know, because when he kept me stuck in the house and I blew up big as, as the world, uh, it, it was nowhere to go. He, he, he would bring food home when he wanted to bring food home. When he wanted sex, he got sex because I was stuck in the house. I had to change my pattern. Change your pattern. And if you don't have money to go out the house, you know what I would do? I would just change the room around. I would change my environment. I would make it look different to encourage myself. I will learn how to bake a cake, learn how to do cookies. That was my process of getting up by changing my patterns daily because I was down so long. 
If I had a moment of tears, I wouldn't forsake my tears from doing what they were needed to do. They needed to get out because of how I was feeling. So I cried. It was where I was in my process. I would let them suckers out. I wouldn't forsake myself from crying. And people say, no, you can be strong. No, I need to cry right now. I'm going to cry. But I ain't going to stay in my cry. I ain't going to stay down, right? After I cry, then I will make myself go into praise. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Praise is a garment. It's a weapon. You got to put it on and you got to use it. It's a garment. And it's a weapon. You got to put it on and you got to use it. I made it my business to get up and take a step every day. I made a move every single day. Some days I took more steps than others. But my minimum each day, I took a step. It had to be a step forward. Even if my tears was being released out of my eyes because of where I was in process, I still took that step. Listen, beloved, you have to emotionally invest in yourself. Get out the rut of emotional trauma. If not, you will repeat the cycle. If you don't want that type of consistency in your life, nope. Tell your pretense self goodbye. Let's put codependency finally to rest. Let's funeralize and commit it to the ground. Listen, we're about to go to the go to the gravesite, go to the burial site. Y'all ready? I got my pastoral book in my hand. <laughs> Y'all ready? Friends, we are gathered here at the final resting place of codependency. We no longer cherish it or the memories of it. We are no longer sustained by it and neither are we comforted by it. So we commit it back to dry places to return no more. Ashes to ashes <laughs> and dust to dust. May the Lord God resurrect the image of God in you. May he strengthen you on your God-given journey to remain whole in him from everlasting to everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Mean that. Repeat that every day, every day, if you have to. It's committed to dry places to return no more. Well, this is your girl, Dr. Rock. I just wanted to get on a little bit just to touch the surface of codependency. Our next session will be December the 19th, which is my 14th anniversary. And I will continue our series on codependency because I told you, listen, I'm coming to demolish and destroy codependency because it destroyed, it tried to destroy me but I gave legs to my words, not to their words over me. Listen, married couples, those who are seriously engaged, December 6th, join Strengthening the Strong. This month, we are continuing to talk about sex and communication with Elder Lister Jones, the top needs of a man and a woman. Listen, if you are in need of help because you are struggling with codependency, or if you are in need of coaching, if you need a counselor, if you need mentorship, click the link in the description and get your free 15 minute consultation to get things started. I'm here to help. I'm here for it. Like I said, God is not a God of wasting time and I'm not either. I didn't go through all of this to have all the all of what I experienced to sit in a garbage can. No, I'm here to be a disciple, to help others, to evangelize, to be uh, uh, the way in the wilderness for God to use me to help you. So if you want to get started, click on the link above to get your free 15 minute consultation and we can discuss your needs to get you started on the path to where you belong in Christ. If you would like to be a blessing to the ministry, you can cash app us at cash app us as cash app us at dollar sign. I love healthy me. 
Listen, God bless you. And remember, commit it to dry places to return no more. Let the Lord fill your cup. Blessings to you. See you on December 16th at Strengthen in the Strong or see you on December 19th for our next session of codependency. God bless you guys. I want you guys to live a victorious life in Jesus. It's yours for the asking. It's yours for the taking. It belongs to you. God bless you guys. Amen.